Hey, Bill. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, <laughs> for taking part. Should we start in? Here we go. Here we go. So, yeah, first, thank our sponsors, Black Hills Active Countermeasures and Wild West Hacking Fest. And, in fact, there's a Wild West Hacking event coming up. Uh, this will be in San Diego this year, a couple of weeks out. I'm actually doing a couple of days on using Security Onion as a network monitoring tool. That should be fun. And the Wild West Hacking events are always a good time. We're so glad that this is spreading out from just South Dakota. Uh, nothing wrong with South Dakota, but uh, the fact that we can get more people to come see this content and take part in the event, really happy about it. Although there is that, uh, and I'm sure John did this on purpose, when you talk about Wild West Hacking Fest SD, is that South Dakota or is that San Diego? So, or is it and, standard? And how many other SD cities, states, or towns or counties can we find to actually hold the event in so it stays confusing? <laughs> All right. Cool. So, uh, the talk today is going to be based upon a blog entry that uh, Bill wrote up, which was awesome. I uh, will reference it as we go through. But. <laughs> Quick rundown of what we're going to talk about. And Bill, let me just kind of set you up, and I'll let you kind of kind of transition in from here, because uh, this is something, quite honestly, that's bugged me for a long time. Well, I don't want to say bug me, but is is irk me mildly for a long time now, which is you can't sniff in public cloud, or at least not easy. So you know, if I take a VM and I stand it up in you know Amazon, DigitalOcean, pick your poison, I lose my network security capability. And for a corporate environment, this is a problem because I have tools and processes that I rely on that all of a sudden don't work. So for example, I might be running something like Snort or Sericata, and that's part of my security fabric. That's part of my defense in depth to keep my network protected. But as soon as I stand something up in Amazon, well, I can't sniff that traffic. It doesn't work. So we have, you know, Exempt, we, we may normally have everything behind our IDS IPS, but now all of a sudden we've got exceptions to that rule, which means they are at a higher level of risk than what we normally say. Now, there yeah. are ways to kind of work around that. I could run Sericata on every single system, but ouch, that doesn't scale well. The management doesn't work well. And now I run into the position of, well, if an attacker breaks into that system, what's going to stop them from just you know, deleting, shutting down, or whatever, any of the tools that I have on that box. So what this is, is this is a way to get around that problem. This is a way to go in and actually be able to see the traffic that's going to each of your VMs. And this is cool because, yes, vendors have given us tools, but the tools are kind of blah, meaning that, you know, I, I can go in and I can look at, like, you know, most Public cloud environments have VPC flow logs, they're, they're whatever they want to call it, whatever they want to name it is their equivalent of that. But it's not full packet captures. This is more like NetFlow or IPFix. In fact, yeah, in fact, if you look at the areas that are circled on the slide, this is, you know, uniflow information in each direction that you now have to try and knit together to even see the full session. And, and this is a hassle. So, um, Bill, I'm going to shut up and let you talk for a little bit, uh, which is hard for me, just because I'm so excited about this. But yeah, just kind of talk them through how this works. With the VPC flow logs, trying to, to get a any kind of usable security information out of them is basically impossible. You lose so much of the headers. You have no content to work off of. You don't know where requests were made. Stitching them together, I can put you in touch with a developer who can attest to just how painful this is, and uh, he, he will he, he's smiling right now, I'm sure. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. That's fine. Yeah. So the, the so how do we is, fix it, Bill? <laughs> the goal is let's get something better. Is there some way that we could capture traffic on what what we would think of as the network? even though a lot of it is virtual and hidden inside virtual routers and so on. There is a way, and as we'll talk about, uh, there's some limitations. It's uh, only available in some environments. We'll talk about those limitations, but let's see how this is done. In a VPC on Amazon, you run all your traffic through an internet gateway. And this is a, a picture of how that's laid out. You have multiple servers, 
that want to talk to the internet, they send their traffic out through a, an internet gateway, which is a virtual machine of its own that Amazon provides. And then you have uh, traffic, um, you want to send all that traffic over to a network monitor. Chris, I'm going to, to uh, just take a slightly different perspective on the slide. In fact, it's the internet gateway. Oh, no. Nope. I say, no, let me back that statement up. We're all set. The slide is actually perfectly correct. So what we want to end up with is that each server is reporting traffic over to the network monitor. And we're going to talk at the 50,000 foot view level of how that's done today. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> basically what you're doing is you have two network interfaces on each of these systems. One of them is your normal system for communications. And then the other one is going to facilitate, facilitate this tunnel and get a copy of all the packets that are going in and out of that interface. There was a question that came through in how does this work in like a serverless environment? The, the answer is it doesn't, <laughs> at, least no. not that, at least not that I've seen yet. Maybe there'll be something in the future. Probably not, because once you're running serverless, you're basically running in a shared environment with everybody else. So having this type of capability would mean you're seeing everybody else's traffic too. And uh, vendors probably are, and other customers are probably not going to be too thrilled about that. So this is more of a virtual machine type of solution than anything else. Exactly. And the whole point of serverless is that you get to, get to dispense with all of the management tasks involved with a full virtual machine. If we get back to the point where we're capturing traffics off of interfaces and configuring all of that, you've, you've lost the benefits of going serverless. All right. So totally if you agree. look at this and you think of the purple box in the middle as a router, equi equivalent of a router in your building, then what you have on the lower left of that router heading over to the network monitor is essentially a span port. And so that's what allows us to do this in, a, in an AWS environment. Uh, let's, let's see how this is done. Go ahead, Chris. The is, yeah. yeah. So, do, but, so do you want me to go through this since I'm not colorblind? Feel free. Yeah, <laughs> it always helps. I, I, I went through about. markup this. So, uh, so Bill and I have known each other forever, <laughs> and I feel like an absolute idiot because I went through and marked up the slide for him. And then, you know, he came back to me later and he said, you know, Chris, I looked at this the first time and it really confused the hell out of me. And then once I realized it has color in it, it made more a lot more sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're looking at here is a decode of a packet that we had gone in and gone in the interface of a different system that then got tunneled over to this monitoring system via VXLAN. And this is what you actually see on the VXLAN system. So in between the red brackets here, this is the exposed IP header. So this is what you'd see out on the network. Notice it's identifying as being protocol 11. So this is byte nine, protocol 11. 11, it, once I convert that to decimal, comes out to be UDP. And then if I go in and I look inside the UDP packet and look at what port was it going to, that was going to port 4769. So go away. Go away, tools. You're not being helpful. <laughs> there we go. All right, I will just leave that alone and hopefully it will go away on its own. Nice. So what VXLAN is doing is it's taking the original packet that went inside of this VM, it's encapsulating it, not completely, it's just putting a header on it, no trailer, but it's encapsulating the packet. And then that encapsulation is what allows it to get to whatever system it is we want to go in and do the monitoring on. So <laughs> again, this is my exposed IP header. So this is what we'd see on the wire. Inside of that is my Ethernet header. So notice we're even getting the layer two information that gets conveyed through as part of this tunnel. After that, this 4500 value, that's a great indicator to, that uh, that's probably an IP header, which it is. This is the inside header, which was a uh, protocol six TCP packet that was going to that internal system. Now notice up here, I'm actually seeing that inside header. In other words, TCP dump recognizes this was uh, something inside of a tunnel 
And it's showing me the packet being tunneled, not the actual tunnel itself, if that makes any sense. So that could be confusing when you first look at these because you might look at this and see, hey, this protocol doesn't match what's going on up here, what's going on. Again, this is just the way that VXLAN works. Bill, did I get that stuff right or? Absolutely, and I would just, for people who, have, who are coming across this for the first time, the packet on that slide is what shows up at the monitoring system. It isn't sending the original raw packet through because it, that raw packet was never destined to that system. What we're seeing on there is what AWS generates after you've gone through the setup process so that the inner packet can make it over to the monitoring system. Exactly right. Perfect. Cool. Couple Bill, you want to keep running with this? Yeah, go for got it. it. One is that not every tool knows how to look at a VXLAN packet and figure out that there's an outer header and an inner header. So there are a couple of tools that we know do support it. Zeek, if you have version 3 or higher, Suricata 415, Wireshark 1.8 or higher, Network Miner does. But keep in mind that when you simply say yum install or apt install my favorite sniffing tool, they may not be installing the most recent version. So pay attention to the version that you get before you're sure. Yeah, um, Zeke, it's pretty easy if at the command, if you're using the bro command, it's out of date. <laughs> it's the older version that doesn't recognize this. If it's yeah. Zeke, you've got the latest version, you're okay. Bingo. And obviously, if you're using a tool that consumes output from one of these, then you're all set. And our example, of course, there is Rita, the open source uh, package that we produce. Now, what happens if you've got a tool that doesn't know how to read that format? Well, we've got two packages that might help with that. This is, this is a workaround. It's not a fix for the problem. But the workaround is if you've got a package, a sniffer that you really want to use and it has no clue what a VXLAN packet is and it simply reports that you're getting thousands and thousands of UDP port 4789, whatever the port was, packets, but never sees the internal stuff. There are two packages here that you can use to extract the internal packets from what you get at the monitoring system. This is offline. So what you have to do is capture the packet, send them down to a file, run one of these two tools against what you get, and then you get the raw packets back. It's a short-term workaround. It's not a great approach for long-term. Get your vendor to figure out how to go and recognize VXLAN. And I do feel the need to point out that the first link is Bill's website, because as usual, Bill says, oh, I have this problem. Let me just write a tool to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> Happens all the time. Stripe is going to be a lot faster. It's a compiled program. I included the PCAP modify simply because there are some environments where you can't bring in outside compiled Binaries. code. PCAP yep. modify is a Python script and would could be able to let you bring that in. Jason, what do you got? I got a couple questions. Uh, so this is from Jonathan. So I know Suricata has a VXLAN parser, but how to strip out VXLAN with Snort? I, I took a long time. Uh, when we were writing this presentation to try to find any reference of whether Snort knows what VXLAN is or not, I could not find any reference that said whether whether Snort handles VXLAN or not. I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, if, if only we could still beat up Marty Rush on this. I know. I should, I should. That would make life so much easier. I should give him a call, but I'm not sure his cell phone works in the middle of the Caribbean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So sorry, Jason, no answer, but if somebody's got an authoritative answer and can point us at a link, please feel free to post that into the uh, questions and we'll relay that. Sure. Uh, this next one's got a couple acronyms in it, so I'll do the best I can. Is VXLAN only used if you cross VPCs from source to monitor tool, or is it no. also used if it's still in the same VPC? What about across, uh, I think, AZ as Azure? Azure? Uh, AWS regions you're talking about? Uh, the last uh, uh, availability AZ. zones. I think AZ, AZ is availability AZ. zones. Yeah. So, and, and the uh, answer is no. It's the same format, no matter whether you're inside a VPC, you're crossing VPCs, yep. or if you're going across availability zones. 
keep in mind if you're going across availability zones, you're shipping a, what could be a substantial amount of traffic between sites, and that may add up to uh, extra bandwidth costs. Yeah, you'll even see uh, layer two traffic, things that are just generated as part of uh, within the local VPC itself, like Bill was saying. So if this is a straight copy of everything going in and out of a specific network interface. So you're going to see everything, just like yep. if you were running a sniffer. And then another question from Alexi, I believe. How does it impact performance of the instance sending the traffic, and what are the cost implications? Uh, this should not affect the instance sending the traffic because the Amazon infrastructure is the one that's making copies of packets. Yeah. Um, so this is so this is one of the reasons we'll see in just a minute that you need to use Amazon Nitro instances because those instances have the code in place to do this packet mirroring. Um, it shouldn't affect your process, internal processing at all because the the system itself is not doing any extra work to make a, two copies of the packet. Yeah, the processing is going to all be taking place on the monitor. That's the one to, uh, that you have to watch resources on, but that's not the one acting as a public-facing server. Bingo. All right, so let's keep going. So the approach is that we, we're doing this all in AWS. We'll talk about other cloud later. All of this is done inside a virtual private cloud. And that's a collection of systems and gateways and network setups and all of them that make an, a, a cloud environment for you to do your work. You need an internet gateway. You have systems in the VPC that you want to watch, and you're sending the packets from those systems over to the network monitor. This traffic is mirrored. It should be obvious if you're, if, but if, but if not, <laughs> your packets still continue on to their original destination. The mirroring is done where we make a second copy to send over to the monitoring system. And, la and then we have to do something with those packets over on the monitoring system. And just like the South Park underpants gnomes, of course, once you've done all of phase one, phase two, we have to figure out later, but phase three is profit. Yes. And um, yeah, just an uh, important point with mirroring means that you can monitor, you can't modify. So Correct. this is a great solution for like an intrusion detection system, not so great of a solution for like an intrusion prevention system. So think it, no, Bill was saying, think of it as being similar to a span port on a switch. Yeah, yep, exactly. So you have no ability to say yay or nay or modify or log or anything. The, the packets will continue to their final destination no matter what your IDS happens to think about. But oh my God, at least you can see them. Too true. <laughs> Jason? Yeah, Angela has a question. Uh, which instance must be a Nitro instance? The sniffer? The sniffed systems. Yeah, have the to actual be servers. Yep. The, so all of the machines that you want to watch have to be Nitro instances. I don't believe that requirement is true for the monitor system as well, but you might as well keep your, keep your um, systems. I, actually, I can confirm that it is not a requirement for the monitor system. I tested that. Great, thank you, Chris. And then uh, Eugene has a uh, just a clarifying question. So he wants to know, so to confirm, this is not an original packet from client to server, it's a modified packet with v VXLAN tags inserted? A prepended, yes, exactly. Yes. So if, Chris, if you wanna back up to that previous slide and tell me what the two colors are. Meaning the drawing? Yeah, yeah, the no, the uh, packet capture, the... Uh, ah, here, we, here go. we go. What are the first, colors? The first one is red, the second one is blue. So the in, inner packet is in blue. Yep. Yeah. The, the inner packet is the unmodified one that will also continue off to the outside world or to the monitored system. The And, and that one is, is just set pristine. And then the outer, the red part, is what's prepended to that before it's sent over to the monitor system. Yeah, I also saw a question about uh, what happens if the MTU gets exceeded. I don't know. Uh, this is not exactly, this is not an Ethernet network per se. It's a point-to-point -point network. So I don't think MTU is an issue here. It, if you did, it, I think, I think th it, that may be a valid point. If it were, 
if it exceeded the size limit for the packets going across the VPC, then the Amazon side would be responsible for chopping that big packet up into multiple pieces. But that shouldn't affect your ability to sniff it. Well, I think what they're saying, though, is, um, you know, if, if, I've, if I've got a packet that's already at full MTU, and then this adds in another 30 bytes, and that pushes it over the MTU size, what happens? And like I said, it, it's what we're creating with this uh, v, um, excuse me, what we're creating with this VXLAN tunnel is a point-to-point -point link. It's not Ethernet. Ethernet is where you get that MTU mm -hmm. requirement. They may have very well have created a larger MTU for this, for that type of thing not to happen. I don't know. I haven't seen anything getting fragmented. So Good point. Okay, excellent. What else uh, you got, Jason? Yeah, one last, and uh, we have a bunch of questions coming in, but we'll see what we can hit towards the end. So another clarifying question, is the packet delivery guaranteed or do you, or do you have to consider oversubscription or the monitoring instance? Ah, uh, it's UDP, baby. <laughs> yep. And and it, it, even if even if AWS guaranteed that the packet would make it over to the network monitor system, there's no guarantee that the monitor system can keep up with the flow. So it kind of doesn't matter whether AWS guarantees delivery or not. You have to assume that there will be packet loss at the monitoring system and compensate for that. Yep. Yep, oh. make sure you allocate enough resources. Uh, one last one. Uh, we've gotten a couple of questions. Will this approach work the same at GCP or Azure? We'll talk about Azure at the end of the, of the presentation. Yep, short, no. short answer is no, but we'll get into it later. Got it, thanks. Well, the one last question I saw that I wanted to address is, um, you know, what does this mean, this five bytes, not four, huh? Uh, this is TCP dump lingo. The first four bytes is my IP address. My last byte here, this is the port. So this is the source port that was used by this IP when it was communicating to this IP address at this specific port number here, 0.993. So that's why you're seeing five bytes instead of four. Yep. Okay, and I think we left off right about here. So what we wanted to do in the you know 45 minutes that we've got today is talk about the general steps. We're not going to show you exact commands to run. We have a blog, and so if you grab that URL at the bottom, you can head over and see the original blog that we wrote last fall that has pointers off to additional sources, including Amazon's original presentation, original blog describing how this feature works, we wanted to show you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it as well. So plenty more details in there, and it also individual commands and steps that you need to do. Don't worry if you don't have time to write down that URL. The entire presentation PDF is will be available, and I'm guessing that Jason will paste that over into chat in just a minute or two so that you can pull down the PDF and copy it from there. Correct. Yep. Uh, we're putting those into the chat, so if everyone takes a look at your uh, control panel, take a look down at the chat, you'll see the links to everything that we've been talking about today. Sounds great. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. All right, so AWS requires that these be Nitro instances. They have non-Nitro and Nitro versions of their instances that you can sign up for. The reason why you need Nitro is that this has the ability to look at packets coming out of the system and send them off to a second instance. If you try to do this with non-Nitro instances, it's not going to work. Storage. You should have enough space to hold the PCAPs that you need over on the monitor virtual machine. How many processors and how many cores always depends on how much traffic that you're going to look at. Don't cut that short. Give it, give it some beefy power, especially if you plan to monitor multiple servers. Especially if you're going to do processing of those packets on this system and you plan to use multiple tools. So if you're yes. grabbing like full PCAPs and running Zeek at the same time and running Sericata, yeah, that's obviously going to need more RAM and CPU than I'm just going to run Zeek and call it a day. So, yeah. 
We happened to use CentOS in when we did this because we knew that all the tools were available. You can use any distribution that you'd like. You're not specifically required to even use Linux. Just pay attention to the tools that you've got and make sure that the versions are available. I used a CentOS just because I always use Ubuntu and it was time to go back go back to my roots. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. All right. Cool. So with Chris, the, uh, I have to apologize. I have to step away for just a moment. I'll leave the, leave the uh, audience in good hands. Just a moment. Cool. Go take care of Milo, dude. So, um, yeah. So when you go into your uh, Amazon AWS console and you go under VPC, you're going to notice in the top left-hand side a list of a bunch of different sections of VPC that you can go in and kind of mess around with. Here's the order we're going to walk through them. In other words, we'll start with creating a VPC first. Then we'll go in and create an internet gateway. Then we'll go in and create routing table entries. Then we'll go in and create subnets. So those will be the first couple of steps that we do in all of this. Now, as Bill said, we're not going to cover every single specific command. Bill did, now that he's away, I can say nice things about him and not inflate his ego. Bill wrote an awesome, awesome blog entry. And it really does go through every single step. Do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. So this is designed more to kind of highlight what's already in that blog entry. So you already have copy paste for a lot of these steps there. This just adds some kind of visualization to what had Bill had in his blog entry as well. So again, the place we're going to start is with creating a VPC. So go in, just create a VPC, give it some sort of descriptive name. I call this mirror testing because I'm just not a creative person. And then go in and create a CIDR block. So this is the subnet addressing you want to use inside. Now, you can go in and create a large block. You know, you could call this like 10.x and then create multiple subnets inside of that if you want to. So that way, if I, have, if I want to have a single VPC that's broken up into different sections based on maybe usage of each server, I can do that. And I can have it all run back to a single monitoring system. We did not cover that here for simplicity's sake, meaning that we didn't want to make this any more complex than it has to be. But if you wanted to call this CIDR block 10 dot something, and then later when you start carving out subnets, use class Cs within that, you do have that choice. In the slide, I show uh, Amazon provided IPv6 address. Go in and use that. If you want to use IPv6, go for it. I will say for initial setup, it adds a layer of complexity to this, meaning that you've got IPv6 packets as well as IPv4 packets going by, and sometimes that can make things a little bit harder to figure out, is it working the way you expect it to? So you can have IPv6 turned on or off, it'll work just as uh, fine just uh, either way. But like I said, the first, if you're doing this is like a test environment hey, I want to do this and set it up just to make sure it works, shut off IPv6. It'll make your life easier. Then once you've gone through it and you know how to set this up and you feel confident with the setup, and now you're going to set it up for production, go ahead and turn on IPv6. So once we create a VPS, um, <clears throat> excuse me, once we create a VPC, the next thing we need to do is go in and create a VPN gate, an, uh, an AWS internet gateway. And the steps for that is pretty straightforward. What's not as obvious, or at least was not to me, is once you create, when you're creating it, you don't associate it with a VPC at the time. So once you've created it, there's an additional step where you need to go in, highlight it, as you saw I did here. Notice it's listed in it as being detached. And you just go in and you say, I want to attach it to this VPC, or I want to attach a VPC to it. Once you do that, this screen appears, and now you just identify the VPC that you want to use. I will say as you go through these, these big, long, descriptive numbers that are hard to remember, uh, write these down. As you're going in and you're creating the ENIs, you're creating the VPCs, just make a quick mental note of them because you'll, you'll get into situations later, things like you'll have two network interfaces on a, on a system to be monitored, ETH0 and ETH1, and each one will have a different address associated with it. You will need to associate it with it with the right one because if you pick the wrong one, hey, no surprise, everything does not work. Um, you want to make sure you get those numbers right. So just make yourself some notes as you go through this. That'll make your life a whole lot easier.
And as Chris is doing on that slide, if you note the IDs and so on, they start IGW for Internet Gateway and VPC starts with VPC. Uh, it'll help your brain quite a bit when you're trying to figure out what to, what object you're looking at if you make the first couple of characters of the identifier the, op, the object type. Yeah, and you can write the number down. You can uh, do a quick screen cap of that area, paste it into a doc as you go work through this, you know, whatever makes your life easier. So once I get the Internet Gateway attached, then I need to go in and create some subnets. And specifically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a default route entry that just says, hey, all of the traffic that's leaving this host, I want to be able to send it out through my Internet Gateway. So I just go in. It'll show me some default routes that have been set up. I go in. I tell it I want to edit the routes for, for that VPC. I go in and I just say, hey, default route for uh, IPv4 default route for IPv IPv6, save those routes, and now you'll see those get updated and be listed as active as well. So now I've got my VPCs in, I've got some subnets set up, and I've got my routing set up. All of that should be working at this point. Now we go in and create a subnet inside of a subnet, like I was talking about. Now, if you've just created a class, if you originally created a class C, just specify the same class C here, and that'll work out fine. If this is a production environment and I want to put databases in one subnet, web servers in another, or something along those lines, uh, you can go in and set it up that way. Um, we did not cover it here, like I said, just to try and keep this whole thing simple. But go in, identify the VPC that this is going to be a part of, identify what you want to use for subnets, go in and create those, and you're going to be in good shape. Now, once you've done that, you want to go in and start creating the instances that um, that will get monitored. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's two different types of systems we'll create. We'll create the monitor system, and there's only one, and that's the one that's going to receive all of these packets. And then we're going to create these systems to be monitored that we'll obviously be grabbing all the traffic from as traffic goes to and from those systems. Can you take a system on a different VPC and move it into this one? I couldn't find an easy way to do it. Uh, there may be a way to do it through the API that I just didn't run across. I don't know. But I found I had to create it within the VPC. You may be able to shift stuff around later. It's easier if you just set it up here to begin with. But again, keep track of these numbers because as you can see, you're going in and you're kind of selecting them as you do. So when I go in and I say I want to create a new instance, I pick the operating system, I pick the size, and when I get into the details of the configuration, this is going to default to whatever network is normally the default that my, uh, my instances get deployed on. I'm going to need to change it to this VPC that I created. The subnet will default to whatever the default subnet is. I'll need to change it to the one within this VPC. And I thought this was kind of neat. Oh, look, it's even telling me how many IP addresses I have left. Isn't that neat? <laughs> Cool. Bill, you want to pick up this part? You got it. Actually, so, uh, let me ask a question real quick just to make sure. Um, does AWS allow for routing of the VXLAN traffic similar, similar to remote span, or is it new VPC required for each monitored system? No, you can have multiple systems that you're monitoring inside a VPC, for starters. And we're not going to cover how to have a monitored system in one VPC and the monitored, sorry, monitoring system in one VPC and the monitored systems in another. It is possible, but it made the setup more complex. Uh, again, By a long if shot. Trying, <laughs> yeah, if you're trying this out, just get everything working in one VPC. There's no reason why you can't say, oh my gosh, I've got 12 VPCs up in Amazon. How do I direct all of the traffic into one, well, just make a monitoring system in each one. Yep. Uh, and then one more question. Have you used this between AWS services such as E3 to Glacier? I know from experience that those are hidden costs that can be quite high. For directing the logs out to Glacier, perhaps? Is that maybe the intent? Hard to say. This is really about AWS instances as opposed to the other services that you can run on Amazon. Yeah, um, EC2. Yeah, let's, let's stick with EC2 for the day. Makes it much easier. All right. Yeah. 
Yeah, Probably and as far as like where to put the logs, yeah, you could store them to S3 or Glacier or whatever if you want to, or you can just leave yep. them on the VM, uh, whatever yep. makes your life easier. Absolutely, 100%. So when you're putting these tools in, you you pick the tools that you want to work with. What type of what kind of information do you want to pull out of the packets? That's the first job. If you install something with the default packages included with the operating system, just be aware that they can be older than current. And so you want to check the version that's installed to make sure that you've got one new enough, at the very least, to handle VXLAN traffic. Beyond that, it's just up to you about whether you want the absolute latest and greatest. Zeek, you want to edit Etsy Rita config.yaml to show what, what your local addresses are. With Suricata, we've included a link to how to install it on CentOS. Again, you can use any distro that you want. The advantage here of doing it from source is that you know that you got the latest version. If you like Wireshark, uh, you absolutely can run graphical tools even up on an AWS EC2 instance. Uh, but keep in mind, you also have T Shark, which is the command line version and basically includes most of the features that you find in Wireshark. But you can do this right over an SSH terminal. If you want to run the actual Wireshark executable and have it come back to your desktop, just make sure you're SSHing to that system with the dash X command line parameter. Say, I also want to carry X Windows traffic back. Note that you are on the monitoring system. You're actually going to be sniffing packets off of ETH1. ETH0 is the default gateway, the way that this monitoring system gets in and out to the internet by itself. When you set this all up with sending packets from a monitored system to the monitoring system, those packets, they don't get mixed in with the normal traffic that this system creates when it does DNS lookups or you SSH in or anything else. It makes a brand new interface for to sniff on, and that's why you want to make sure that your particular tool is listening on ETH1 instead of ETH0, and depending on how you set it up, maybe ETH2, ETH3, and ETH4 as well. Yeah, and just to kind of drive home what Bill was saying, monitoring ETH1, he's talking about on the monitoring system itself. So the hosts that are being monitored, you'll be monitoring ETH0. You'll be monitoring their primary interface. But as that traffic comes back to the monitoring system, you're going to run a sniffer to see that traffic coming in. It will be coming in on the ETH1 interface. That's the one you want to point at. Um, also, also, I want to say that support <laughs> for VXLAN is kind of a fluid term. So for example, earlier we showed you a TCP dump output and TCP dump can be considered to be VXLAN compatible because it will show you, oh, hey, here's the VXLAN header and then here's the you know header that's buried inside of it. But uh, if you go in and try and write a filter, the filter is only gonna get applied to the external header, not the internal header. So you can't go in and say, oh, uh, you know, only show me a traffic associated with this specific target IP address. It, it's because you're only going to be able to write your filters to match against the uh, actual tunnel itself. So, yeah, it's so some tools are zero percent compatible. Some of them are like 50 percent compatible. Some of them are 100 percent compatible. You really need to kind of sit down and play with it to kind of figure that out. And we're going to run through each of these tools at the end so you can kind of see what we're talking about with that. Jason, what you got, I, Jason, dude? A couple of things is I think all of us want you to go pet the dog. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing our best. I'll tell you what, I'll give him a treat. There we go. What a monster. <laughs> Just, <laughs> he, he would normally be at daycare, but he's sick, and so he's home. Yeah, uh, and then the other is any issue with packet time stamp drift? Hmm. Uh, Good question. The, the time stamp on the outer packet might be a few microseconds past the inner packet, I suppose. But I wouldn't say that that's going to drift because virtual machines, including cloud instances, get their time stamps off the physical machines that they sit on. So I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. Feel free to send in a follow-up if I missed the point entirely. Yeah, so any any timestamps inside of the packets, Bill, 
So like ICMP, a timestamp query, let's say. That, that's going to be the endpoints doing that. So that obviously will not change. I think right. the question is around the rec- time it gets recorded. What difference is that going to be? And I'm with you. We're talking less than microseconds here because yeah. you're talking about basically a, a software copy from one virtual link to another virtual link to get a copy of this packet. Uh, the timing on that should be pretty minimal. I agree. I, I'm kind of lost on like where that might actually cause problems. I know like with Rita, we get very specific with timing in order to identify beacon timing and the drift I've seen isn't even enough to kind of throw those numbers off. So yeah, yeah. So you should be in good shape. Yeah, let's leave that as a short answer. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> so it, the... When you've got these systems set up, there are basically five steps that you need to do. Just for, if you haven't used this term before, ENI stands for Elastic Network Interface. And if you think about this as an ETH device that you could attach to one EC2 instance, and then later you say, oh, I'm gonna shut that one down and I've got this new one all ready to to receive packets now. Let's pick it up, move it across and attach it to a new EC2 instance. The traffic that comes into that ENI doesn't change. Uh, it, It stays static, but you can move it around from one sniffer system to another. So you're going to make up an ENI for the system that you are watching and possibly, and, but you're definitely going to make one up for the network monitor. The first step is optional. I find it a little easier just to literally listen on the existing interface through which the system is talking already, but you do need to make up a new one for the network monitor. Then you tell AWS that I, here is the system that's going to get the packets. And then you then the fourth step is to make a filter saying, I only want to send this type of traffic through from the source system to the destination. And that can be everything. Or you can say, look, I only want to watch uh, HTTP and HTTPS. And that reduces the amount of traffic that you send across to the sniffer. Finally, there's what's called a traffic mirror session. And that takes all of the above and glues them into one thing that says I'm grabbing packets from this monitored system. I'm only grabbing packets of this type. It's coming from this interface. I'm going to send it over to this monitoring system and I'm going to stuff it into an elastic network interface. And that last step is the one that actually starts the packets flowing. Now, once you've got that going for one monitored system and you want to start sniffing on another, You have to do the same thing again. The nice thing is that you can reuse the Elastic Network Interface on the network monitor so that you can have multiple systems feeding into a single ETH1 over on the monitoring system. But basically, you're doing all of the steps over again for every system you want to watch. For anybody who's listening to this and saying, wow, can I just listen to an entire subnet? The answer is no you need to do each individual server separately. Yep. Cool. Um, There was a question in here. Would Security Onion as a monitoring box fit into this setup? And yes, it would, so long as you load it up in Amazon. So, so long as you, I, um, I have not looked. I would be shocked if there isn't a community VM image for Security Onion up there. And if so, then, yeah, you could load that up on your monitoring system. As Bill was saying, just make sure all your tools are up to date, and then you're, you know, you're set and you're ready to go from there. Let's see. You don't need to create an additional ENI for each monitored system, do you? Can't you listen to the existing ENI on any Nitro system? You would, you would listen to the existing interface yeah. on the Nitro systems that you're, listen, you're monitoring. So, so no, you do not have to make a new ENI for the systems that you're watching. You can if you choose to. That's optional. All right. Cool. So the network interfaces. 
Excuse me. So yeah, so you need to go in and you need to attach the network interfaces that you're making here. And again, this goes back to what I was talking about before where keep track in your head. Now that I'm thinking about that drawing, I probably should have labeled ETH0 versus ETH1 on everything. Uh, just remember that on the monitoring system, it's ETH1 that's going to be receiving this tunnel. And for the interfaces to be monitored, it's always going to be ETH0. So long as you keep that, that straight, you pick the right instant ID numbers and then right at network interfaces for those, you'll be in good shape. Traffic mirror filters, Bill talked about this. So should you, should you reduce what you see? You know, in other words, can you, should you go in and actually use this ability to filter to ignore things to get captured? That kind of comes down to how much traffic are you seeing? I, I kind of have a mixed feeling about this one. It, it's the, if you filter things out here, that's less storage requirements. So if I go in and say, only show me HTTP and HTTPS, everything immediately goes away. And now my packet captures will only have that stuff in it. Uh, that makes it pretty, pretty minimal. My only concern with doing that is that if this is within the Amazon interface, if I'm on the host and I'm trying to see everything, I might think that's the only stuff going by. In other words, this is, this is in a different configuration someplace. I'd almost feel like if you're better off within your packet capture tools, let's say you're using TCP dump to capture all this traffic, go in with TCP dump and do your filtering there versus within the Amazon interface. That way, if there's something you're missing, when you log into the host, you see, oh yeah, look at my TCP dump filter. That's why I'm not seeing my SSH traffic. Let me tweak it and I'm okay. I just, you know, be consistent with what you do is really where I'm going. So can you do this? Yes. Is it a good idea? I would, I, I see the value of it, but I would personally lean away from it because I'd want to have all my filtering in one spot, which would be where I'm actually capturing the traffic. I don't know, Bill, what's your spin on this? What do you think? I think it's largely down to load. If your system monitoring system can keep up with the incoming stream, then do your filtering there. If you get to a point where your monitoring system simply can't keep up with the flow of packets, then this would be a good fallback to say, let's not throw everything with the kitchen sink at our monitoring system. Let's leave out the kitchen sink. Yep. Although at that point, maybe it's time to just increase the instance so you don't have an issue there. That's true. Good point. Cool. So traffic near the target. Again, the, the target is uh, the endpoint target is going to be the monitoring system. This is going to be the ETH1 interface on that system. So again, make sure you keep those interface names right. And then identify the interface to monitor, which again, this is going to be the ETH0 interface on the system being monitored. And where does it go to? It goes to ETH1 on the monitor system. So monitoring, monitor, ETH0, ETH1. Gee, you'd almost think I messed that up a couple of times, and that's why I'm making such a big point of keep your Ethernet zero and Ethernet one straight. Mm. It would never happen. Trust yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, so next we get in. Oh, go for it, dude. Nope. So great. So the the next one is to make sure that whatever tools you start up to actually watch traffic, make sure that they're set to auto start if the, the monitoring system reboots. And then once you're happy with that, then you don't have to worry about the, the system being restarted and <laughs> your, your sniffer no longer works. For testing, Chris, do we have actual examples of tests on the next couple slides? Yeah, we do. We do. Okay, so I, I have examples of starting like starting up a command like like T Shark with an ampersand at the end. So right. the idea was, you know, just get T Shark up and running mm -hmm. to be able to look at the traffic and see what's going on. And my point with this slide was, Bill, you did a great job of documenting this is how to get it to run all the time. This is how to get it to survive reboots. What I did is just like a one-time spot test. It is not going to survive reboots. So do what Bill said first, then you can go back and do this if you want to. Or just <laughs> use this great. as part of the example. If, you've done, if they've done what you've told them to and then reboot, hey, all the monitor stuff is there and you're in good shape. So as it says, follow the blog, follow the blog, follow the blog. 
<laughs> but here's an example. So we've got T Shark running on the Ethernet one interface. I'm using the dash T field switch to be able to specify, hey, just show me source IP, destination IP, protocol, and then the UDP destination port, and then show me the length. And notice all of these are actually UDP ports, and this is all my tunnel traffic. Notice I've got a gap in here. This is anything that doesn't meet my filter, which in this particular case was IPv6 traffic that was also taking place on that network. So if you're running this and you notice that you get like blank lines, why are you getting the blank lines? Well, because it saw a packet that didn't match whatever filter you set up here. That's why it's printing out a black line for you. And in here, I'm looking for IPv version 4 information, not IPv6. That's why it didn't print anything out. But this is showing me, hey, look, my tunnel's working. So this is my system being monitored. This is my monitor, uh, the system doing the monitoring. You know, my tunnel's coming in. So far, so good. Life is happy. And then here's TCP dump. So this is a little bit of an expand on what we had before. Before, I used the dash capital X switch that shows you the full decode. And in this case here, we're just going in and looking at the headers. But notice every time TCP dump prints out, it's printing out, here's my tunnel, here's my VXLAN traffic here, and then it's showing me the inner header. This is the actual traffic that's being encapsulated by this tunnel. So you're gonna see two copies of each as you go through. Now I talked about, you know, to me, this means TCP dump is 50% VXLAN compatible. Why only 50%? It's showing it, it's printing it out, it's even showing the inner header, because I can't go in and do something like you know, dash I ETH one space TCP port 80 and only see TCP port 80 traffic. If I added that filter here, I would now see nothing because that filter is only being applied to the outside header and that's it. So again, that's more of like a 50% compatibility. Got a question, Jason? Yeah, going back to the, the beginning, how will this work with Fargate? Fargate. Not familiar Fargate. with Fargate. Yeah, I'm not familiar with Fargate either. Is that a firewall? I'm familiar with Fi Farscape. That was a really good sci-fi series. <laughs> Maybe we can get some clarifying from Jim on what Fargate is. And then uh, just some questions about the Azure. And so I wasn't sure if you were close to the end. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll get to Azure. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Cool. So Sericata. So Sericata is what I would refer to as 100% compatible because it just takes that VXLAN header and throws it away and is done with it, and that's it. So what you see inside of that is what's actually getting detected. So you know, so here, how are we testing that things are working? Well, we're seeing the traffic coming. Here, how are we testing it? You could spoof a, a known blacklisted IP address and send that to your one of the hosts being monitored and make sure you see Sericata go off on the monitoring host and that it actually triggered on that. Or you could do what I did and just wait two minutes because there's so many blacklisted IP addresses out there, especially one scanning EC2, it's gonna show up before you know it. So I didn't even have to craft any packets to get these alerts to go off. They just went off on their own within the first two minutes of having this whole thing set up and running. It's amazing the services that you get for free on the internet. People yes. are actively scanning your systems at no <laughs> charge to you. Awesome. Zeek. So Zeek is another one I would identify as being definitely 100% compatible. Sericata, the only thing missing from Sericata is the fact that the data was in a tunnel and you don't get to see it came out of a tunnel versus you know coming through raw. That may make a difference when you're going through and doing an analysis. Zeek is the only one I would say is absolutely 100% totally VXLAN compatible because A, within the tunnel.log file, it's showing me that it's seeing tunnel traffic. And for the rest of my log files, it's showing me what's being tunneled inside of it. And I don't show it here, but I can take this ID number and cross-reference where these things came from. So I could actually, if I printed out the IDs down the bottom here, I'd be able to see that this first line, you know, came out of this tunnel versus that tunnel because of the ID number. So you've got total correlation on this whole thing. So, you know, out of all the tools we've talked about, Zeek really does have the best uh, support for this. And then, of course, Rita, because Rita consumes Zeek logs, uh, it's fully compatible with this, no problem. 
Now, it came up a bunch of times. What about Azure? What about Azure? What about Azure? They're in preview mode and have been for what, Bill? Like six months now, nine months, I think? At least six months from when I looked. Yeah. So, um, so this is kind of alpha code within their regions. You can go in and kind of play around with this. We have not yet. I think this is going to be one of the next things we go in and try and tackle. But we kind of like to make sure that it's close to whatever the final version is before we actually go in and document it and show people how to use it and build it into software and all that other fun stuff. So this, you know, preview mode thing is what's kind of kept us from going this far down the rabbit hole with them just yet. Hopefully that's something that'll go full production soon. So you have this today in Amazon. It looks like it's coming soon within Azure. Uh, I did not notice anybody else stepping up with this. I don't know if you did, Bill. Looking at like Google and DigitalOcean and others. Uh, we did do a search and found that DigitalOcean, Rackspace, Linode, and Google Cloud do not have any feature like this. Yeah. And I think so you can get slide. VPC flow logs out of most of those. I don't think you do out of DigitalOcean, but you certainly do out of Google. So, like we said, that's like NetFlow IP fix level of data, but not the ability to do this. No, it's not great for an IDS because an IDS wants more than just the fact that two machines happen to be talking on a particular port. It wants all of the details. Yep. And for references, go for it, dude. There's a second blog, which is a kind of a talks about a general sniffing and how you do this in a, in a cloud environment. It's a little bit like this presentation that it doesn't, this particular blog doesn't get into how to do it specifically, but it has pointers to different, it has pointers to the first blog that we talked about and talks a little bit more about the general steps and also a fallback procedure in case you really have to do packet capture in a cloud environment that does not support anything like this. You do have a fallback for Linux systems. Jason. So I'm, uh, we're close to the end, so I want to finish with these two questions. We got a, a follow-up with Fargate. So it's an AWS Fargate as a serverless computer, compute engine for a container that works with both Amazon Elastic Container Service and Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. How will this be impacted by using Kubernetes cluster? I, I'm not sure that this is this a applies to that. Um, yeah, I think this is EC2 only. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I think the last question is a bit of a philosophical question. Um, is, is what you've just talked about the best approach, or would you say a paid system could be more effective and less error sensitive? A paid system, P-A-I-D? Yeah, yeah, like paying for a system to do this. Yeah, so going with like a... Um, Going for like a uh, that uh, sock. Going for like a, a core light virtual system or something along ah, those lines. Because got where it. And and my my understanding is it's not that different than what's set up here. So that would work certainly. And if that if the pay solution you're paying for is the only thing you want, you're fine. If you want flexibility to build on top of that and do other things, it may work out to be a challenge for you. But certainly you could go that route as well. 